invitation that I can be here. So, my name is Matthias Krishna. I have worked for Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, here in my hand, I have more computing power than the whole world had when we landed on the moon. So, this is a very powerful machine. We have more computing power today in our pockets than the whole mankind, everybody on Earth, together had when we landed on the moon. And um, at that time, people wouldn't have imagined what you can do with, with computers in future. And um, today, those machines, they are not just in the space shuttles, in the uh, ground control. No, they are everywhere. They are, as I said, in our pockets. They are uh, on everybody's desk in the offices. They are in supercomputers. They are in cars. They are in planes. Um, they are in uh, fridges. Uh, they, they surround us everywhere. And a lot of us, or some of us, also even have them attached to our bodies, like as hearing aids or as uh, a defibrillator directly connected to our hearts. So, with those machines, they are often all running uh, similar software, like a lot of them, they are running uh, the uh, free, uh, free software operating systems. And um, the, the question is, like if, if all of us here together would today brainstorm about what we can do in future with those powerful machines, it would just come to a very small fraction of what will be possible. It's the same way as people, at, when we landed on the moon, they wouldn't have imagined what we can do nowadays. Even if we come up with the craziest ideas today, um, it will just be a small fraction. And those machines, they will help us in future to solve a lot of pro problems we have as humankind. The question is, who will decide what we can do with those machines and what we cannot do with those machines? Who will control what we are allowed to do? Who will control what we can, how we can program those machines? What they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do? And that's the point where it's about free software. That with free software, we empower people to control their own technology. But that's where I want to go a little bit back. I thought that I'll give you a short overview of how I came to FSFE and why I'm doing all this work and uh, then give you some examples of FSFE's work and highlight a little bit what, how things happened and how people participated to motivate you a little bit to see, oh, that might be something I could also help in future or uh, there's something I can, I can do in future which you didn't get do. And then I would like to give you a short out view, uh, out view what, uh, of some of the plans or two main topics we are, uh, we are doing at the moment. So, um, in uh, 1999, I had uh, one computer at home with a modem uh, to connect to the internet, and I had uh, another computer at home, to, uh, uh, which, which was left over from my, my father's company, and they were in two different rooms, and I had them connected with a network connection, and I wanted to send an email from one of those uh, rooms to the other, just to play a little bit around. And uh, both of them had an email program installed, so there was a sign email. And uh, I tried and tried, but without making the connection to the internet, I was not able to send an email from one room to the other room where my brother was sitting. So uh, I complained at school, and a friend of mine told me, um, yeah, I have something for you. And he gave me some floppies and CDs and uh, said, with this, you can accomplish that. So that was my first GNU uh, Linux uh, distribution. And uh, several hours later, and a lot of phone calls with this friend of mine, I uh, was able to boot into an uh, operating system, white on black, and I was able to enter some commands there. And uh, some weeks later, I even had a, a graphical interface <laughs> running. And so that was how, how I started with the with free software, and then we, we set up a local free software group, we participated at events, um, and uh, went to, to, uh, to other groups and exchanged knowledge there. And um, at the beginning it was mainly technical, uh, 
the technical aspect I was interested in. But after some time, I, um, I found out that free software is more than just that I get this, uh, all those CDs there and, uh, and then share it with each other so everybody gets them uh, and everybody can install the new distribution, which was sometimes really difficult to get with the, the, the broadband, connect, uh, broadband connection wasn't that good in the villages I was living. So, um, but after time I found out that free software is not just about that, but that there are four freedoms which are connected with free software. So I learned more about that free software, with free software everybody is allowed to use it for any purpose. That everybody is allowed to study how it works and can understand all the, the inner workings of the software when you have the source code available, which is necessary for every software to qualify as free software. And that you are always allowed to share the software with others. So if I solve the problem, I can just give it to the friend, uh, friend of mine at school and they can also try it and um, do the same uh, things I, I accomplish at home. And furthermore, also improve the software and change it. Sometimes even make it worse, but at least experiment with it and, uh, and make sure that those machines do things the way I want them to do and not uh, like change myself to something others uh, wanted the program to work. And uh, the more I read there, the more I was also aware that yeah, this is not just about for rights you get, but it's, it's actually about freedoms and it's about uh, a lot of society issues. So, um, like I stumbled over the GNU GPL, which is one of the most widely used uh, free software licenses, and there you see there's it's about freedom, 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 freedom uh, all the time. So that made me wonder, and uh, I, I read more of uh, like articles by, by Richard Stallman, by the the FSF, the GNU project on how all those things, why why they started this movement that they want to make sure that everybody always has those four freedoms to use, study, share, and improve the software. So you you don't depend on someone else, and you are empowered to to. Uh, use those machines on your will. And, um, and then I also got more interested in the, in the political part, where um, I thought, well, uh, with all this, uh, and then with, uh, with our state systems, and how things are supposed to be, how will that be in future? So, like you have, uh, in a state, you have someone, you elect those people, and they are in power then, and uh, we can always decide to elect someone else. But if we don't, or if they, those people we elect, they don't control all this technology, which gets more and more, does it look like that? Or will it in the future look more like, like that? <laughs> so, that's something which, which I was, I mean, not as cool as in this comic, but I, I was wondering about those issues and I was talking with all people around me and uh, tried to convince them why this is an important issue and uh, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't that easy at that time. Um, and uh, well then I decided that uh, I want to study politics uh, because the, the technology part is something when I read the documentation and have a look at that and talk with people, I had the impression that I can understand that much better than how politics work. So um, I decided to, to study uh, politics and uh, management at that time. So, um, and in, in the studies I learned more about like the distribution of power and that in, in, a, in a democracy you should try to make, uh, to build the, the, the state in a way that there are power is distributed, that there is not one person who, uh, who wins against all the others and that, that you distribute this power. It's, it's a little bit like uh, scissor, um, rock, paper. Um, it's uh, for this game to, that it's fun, uh, it doesn't help if uh, paper wins against everybody. So, and that's also with political institutions that you should distribute this power and you should make sure that none is too powerful. And um, in order to, to, do, uh, to do that nowadays when we have more and more computers around us and this is a very important part of our infrastructure, um, we also have to make sure that um, 
that the, the control over all these machines, over all this technology is also distributed. Because else we have the situation that the engineer decides about everything in state. And that's a situation which I at the time I didn't feel that this is, this is the right thing for our society. So um, I continued at university, I talked with a lot of people about free software and then we had this one, uh, one time where uh, in my studies we had to work for seven months somewhere at a company, a public administration or whatever you, you uh, decide to do. And I knew uh, a Debian developer at that time and I talked with him and also asked him if he has some good ideas where I could do those uh, seven months internship. And uh, he told me, yeah, there's um, a federal agency for IT security in Germany and uh, they do a lot about free software. And there is the Free Software Foundation Europe. And before that I haven't heard about them yet. So I, I saw the clue pages, and, but about FSFE I haven't heard. So I, I looked a little bit around. Uh, I sent my applications for the federal agency for IT security. There everything was clear. Internship, you have to provide those documents, send it out. For FSFE, I found, yes, they, they have a postal address there and that's how it looks like, very nice. <laughs> and uh, then I, I called them and uh, someone answered and said, yeah, internships, hmm, I don't know. Can you please write an email? So um, I wrote an email. And I received the reply, yeah, we never had interns before. I said, yeah, well, let's, then I can be the first one. <laughs> uh, then they told me, yeah, but we cannot pay. I said, yeah, I'm also not paid now in my studies. Uh, I, somehow I will manage. So next answer was, uh, we don't have an office. This office here, that's actually just a postal address from a company which is very friendly to us. So they receive the post and also pick up the phone. But we don't have an office. Uh, we have some uh, home office uh, uh, people who work from a home office, but we don't have real offices. And um, at that time, I then suggested that yeah, maybe I can also work from home, or maybe I can work from the offices from the FSF from Boston, from our sister organization. Or um, and at that time, then after some more email exchange, I got a reply. Okay. I think we can meet now <laughs> um, to discuss uh, some of the details and then I got a travel plan from the president at that time from Geneva, Brussels and so on and then we met at, uh, at an airport uh, in Lausanne and discussed about that and, and then um, yeah, that's, uh, it became more and more clear that this is really the thing I want to do and, uh, and then I, I really started there as the first intern but not in an office like that, but in the end it was a sofa in the one-room apartment of the president at that time, Leo Greve. So there was the sofa here, there was a, a, a bed here, and there was his desk there, and a very small room, and that's how uh, I, I spent then the, the next seven months in this room, working with, with Georg all the time, and then traveling around with him. <coughs> and that's where I got like more and more hooked up to the end. To this uh, idea. So one of the first things what which happened at the time was um, the work on software patents. So um, FSE from the beginning uh, or even many of the members already before in other organizations were active um, uh, to work on the software patent issue. So that went over a very long, well, quite a long time and uh, we gave input there. Um, during my internship I was able to, to go to ministries, talk with people there, with, uh, with the others of FSFE, go to journalists, talk with them about free software, why they are bad for innovation, why it's almost impossible to write good software when there are software patents. And uh, it took quite a while, but after, after the end of my internship, um, it was, uh, um, together with lots of organization, it was possible to prevent the birth thing and that the, the directive, which was discussed at that time in the and uh, in, in the European Union was rejected, so we didn't have a situation which is as worse as uh, the one in the US about software patents, where you can patent all kind of ideas and you can almost write no software at all, uh, which is not, where you, you cannot be sure that there is a patent on that and there's a monopoly which is granted to someone else and you're not allowed to, to use that and to, to sell your software anymore. But there, that was one thing where I saw that with lots of people all over Europe that it's possible to prevent something like that. 
with this, uh, that's of course not over. We still have a bad situation in the in the European Union about software patents, and it's it's still very much ongoing. Like in 2013, we were able in Germany that there was a joint motion in the Parliament against software patents and the strengthening of copyright against patents. We uh, just a few uh, months ago there was a decision in India about software patents that they reject those, and uh, it will take. There, there are reforms in. In New Zealand, there are uh, there are discussions going on in the U.S. But that's a topic which is like lots of the topics I will present you. They are going on for a very long time, and it will change. Maybe in lots many many years, we will be able to to have any positive uh, to have positive outcome there in a situation where we say now we can be happy. But yeah, that was one of the first things I saw there. The other one, which was also quite. Uh, present at that time was um, there was a, a court case where Microsoft was suing the European Commission because the European Commission uh, gave them a fine as they were using the monopoly they have in the desktop market to also get a monopoly in the work group server market, so for print and file servers. And uh, that's something where we first supported the European Commission. Uh, to make this decision and explain them all the technical details there together with the Samba team and afterwards when Microsoft sued the European Commission uh, we continued to support the European Commission on that case in front of the Court of Justice and uh, in the end, which was almost 10 years later they had to pay this fine of 860 million euro um, in this process they spent much more around six times more on uh, paying uh, money to some other parties involved there that they don't participate in this court case anymore. And at the time I was, uh, I was uh, interim there, there was one payment to an association for 20 million and also individual money to the, uh, the head of an organization there that afterwards they said, yeah, we, we now stop, we don't have interest there. I was sitting there as a student at the time, and I thought, thought like, wow, how much money do they have to to <laughs> send around uh, and to to yeah give to people that they don't do what they don't want them to do? But in the end, yeah, it's, it took a long time, but we were successful with with that. So you can now write competing software to to Microsoft in that area. And um, yeah, so. One other thing we, we started at the time I, I did my internship was we started our sustaining membership program, the, the fellowship program. So the, um, that's all, all the people who, uh, who donate money to us as individuals and uh, that's something we, we started at the time and which is meanwhile very important for us as an organization because uh, it's uh, more than one third of the, of the donations we receive. Um, to, um, to uh, finance our work is coming from our sustaining members and there are also many of them, the, the overlap between volunteers and sustaining members is also quite big so a lot of the work we, we do is, is done by, by those uh, people and um, this logo we had for the, for the fellowship that's also something which was spread wide around so people put them on their scooters or use them in other ways and meanwhile at free software conference you often see people walking around with t-shirts or on their laptops and uh, yeah that's uh, something I was involved in there and um, and then at the end of my internship I was a little bit uh, sad that it's now all over and I have to go back to university and uh, FSFE at that time said to me like we would love to, to keep you now but it's better if you first finish your studies but it would be nice if we would have someone to do lobby work in Berlin. And uh, that's then when I had to make another decision and the study I did, uh, it was only possible in the very south of Germany at the Swiss border, that was where I did it before, and in Potsdam, which is very close to Berlin. So uh, I decided at that time, okay, I moved to Berlin and do volunteer work for FSV in the uh, in the German capital and uh, yeah that's what I did I started to talk with politicians there 
with, um, at the beginning, mainly with civil servants because they are there for a longer time. So if you don't have a lot of time, uh, uh, you, you talk more to the civil servants as they are there for a longer time too. So when you can convince them, they will be there for another 10 years. When politicians, they can be gone after two, four years. Um, and in this, in this discussion, this was uh, at the beginning, people most of the time they looked at me and thought, like, what a freak, <laughs> uh, long hair, um, and uh, he talks about technology and why this is important for society, for politics, and um, most of them they said, yeah, I don't deal with technology, that's my IT department, and uh, um, then, uh, but after, after some time I had the impression that the more people started talking with them and the more often you go there, um, like the second time you go there, there's oh um, another freak, uh, and uh, but after the third or fourth person who talks with them, they tell their staff like, can you have a look at that? What they are talking about, and so over the years, the knowledge uh, they they got on this, they got more and more. It took a very long time, but when you look back to the progress from 2005, when when I first talked to politicians about that, and nowadays. It's a huge difference. Like something like we now have here that the city of Barcelona wants to do free software. Uh, that's something like 10 years ago. I don't know, how was the situation here? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, <laughs> bad. Yeah, okay. That's also what my experience at that time. But yeah, um, besides talking to politicians, what FSFE also does, and what I, I got involved in there was. Uh, um, we also had lots of uh, several campaigns and activities with, with uh, uh, lots of uh, volunteers. Like um, we had uh, for a very long time, we organized Document Freedom Day. The idea was that we wanted to um, explain people why open standards are important. People on the street, but also politicians, civil servants, companies. Why do open standards matter? Why is it important that people can compete with the standards and it's also uh, free software can, uh, can with, with open standards, free software can also compete against proprietary software. And um, one of the things we introduced there was, at the, at the beginning we thought, okay, will we now uh, tell all the people who do bad things uh, what they are doing wrong? Um, that would have been a lot of work. Um, or do we concentrate to um, highlight those who do good work. And that's what we decided. We made a tart in, in the Berlin group. We always went, uh, decided where to go and whom to give a nice uh, cake for, uh, for open standard, for the open standards work. This one was at uh, a radio station, public radio station, which offered all their, um, all their uh, data also in Org Warbis, uh, so as an open standard uh, audio format. And later we also gave it to a um, television station for uh, open standard videos um, or to uh, newspapers for um, EPUB formats and so on. Um, so that was something where we always want to encourage people who do good things and not just tell others like what, what's still to do. And uh, we also, uh, for this Document Freedom Day, what FSFB did, we sent uh, handcuffs to the Pope. Uh, the background is that um, we asked people to uh, make suggestions who needs education about open standards. So people sent in a large list of people and we said that we will send them uh, a letter with information, why are open standards important, what is free software, and uh, we add some handcuffs to explain that with proprietary standards there's a huge vendor lock-in. And someone also suggested the Pope at that time, so uh, he also received those handcuffs. Um, from him we didn't get feedback, but uh, <laughs> at the time uh, who also received those handcuffs was the Vice President of the European Commission. And a few days later in a talk, uh, and, uh, he, she uh, she talked about that and explained that uh, uh, she received those uh, those handcuffs from us and uh, because we are worried about digital handcuffs and want to know if uh, if she's on our side about open standards and she said yes she is and uh, 
So that was very nice feedback. We got there a, f a few months later. I, I once met her at a conference and uh, told her, yeah, I was the one who sent you those handcuffs. And she <laughs> said, oh, do you know the story? And I, like, what story? And then she explained me this story that after this speech, she had to go to the airport and she had a long discussion with the airport security. In the end, they didn't allow her to take the handcuffs uh, on the airplane. And uh, that was something she was very upset. And I offered to send new ones, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the something else besides this, like the campaign work here on open standards, something we are also involved in from the beginning of FSFE and which was intensified by uh, a little bit after I ended my internship was our legal work. So FSFE always uh, helped developers uh, and companies to understand free software licenses so that they uh, understand what benefits they have from different licenses, how they work, so they are not afraid of those licenses and they can include more free software in their products and are compliant with those licenses. And um, that's also the reason why, uh, why this worked out here, the, the speech, because uh, the next uh, three days I'm here at the workshop from our legal network. So uh, we use this opportunity that I can also come here for the talk. <coughs> And uh, that's something where uh, we realize at a point that in, in companies it's often the legal department which blocks free software adoption. So there are uh, the developers often wanted to use it, but then the legal department said, no, if we use this, we have to publish all our software source codes and. Uh, um, uh, there is this uh, virus going through our uh, company and we have to publish all our internal secrets and uh, that was quite common uh, at that time still and uh, so we, we, um, we started with a network uh, with people from different companies explain them how free software licenses work and then got new people in the network and then the people who are already on the network can explain those topics to the new ones. Because our experience was that it's much better if uh, other companies explain how this works than if the Free Software Foundation Europe tells them, oh no, you don't have to worry, you can, you can do so without any legal risks. It's better if they are big if they are other competitor or, uh, or a company where they are the supplier of those company. Uh, they say, yo, we don't have any problems with that. You can do it like that. We did that for several years. We never had any legal problems with that. And that's something which is, which is ongoing there. Uh, now the network is over 300 people from all uh, kind of uh, companies, legal departments, uh, law firms. So uh, we were able to spread free software, the knowledge about free software licensing much more in the industry. And uh, I think that was a large, large part why, why uh, they are, were not so hesitant and they adopted it faster. Um, at the beginning, I was much more involved in, in German politics because I was living in Berlin. Now, after time, I got more and more involved also in the, in the European issue. So a lot of decisions nowadays are taken in Brussels or even some layers higher, like at the UN bodies or in trade agreements and so on. But a lot of the things, they, they happen in Brussels. So um, while at the beginning I was more involved in the other things uh, and others did the work in Brussels, and I also got more involved there later. And um, what's... Uh, Nowadays, what's very interesting or very, very nice to see is how the situation also changed there. Like, uh, we now are in a situation where the uh, European Commission has an open source strategy where they want to publish more free software, they, um, they want to use more free software, they have different areas, and some of them they, it's already mandatory to use it, in others they want to use it more, their uh, internal developers use more free software tools, uh, we help them to, um, to uh, improve their internal processes so that uh, people working for the European Commission can afterwards publish software as free software and commit changes to, to free software projects. Um, last year, there, a program started which is called the uh, FOSS-A, which is a free software 
um, auditing program where they will uh, find out what free software they are already using in the European institutions and then also make security audits and think about processes how to uh, improve security with uh, free software and what the European Commission can do about that. That's a project which is uh, going on. The last days uh, we raised awareness about uh, there is uh, a question there by the European Commission, uh, Commission about uh, what can we do to improve the future of the internet and they have 750 millions for that and we just found out uh, last week on Thursday about that and uh, someone told us that just the usual suspects, the big companies, they submitted something but if you would divide those uh, 750 millions to the submissions each of the submissions would have 10 million so please send in more <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, that's where we encourage people then to, to also uh, uh, submit ideas there about distributed uh, free software solutions, encryption, mobile, uh, mobile uh, computers on the internet and so on. So that's, that's something where we, we on, on an ongoing basis talk with civil servants there, with politicians there, get involved with MEPs there and uh, try to, to explain them more what free software is about. And um, as I just mentioned, mobile phones, um, they are often um, projects which start as an individual project by someone. Like um, we had this uh, for your Android, the idea was uh, uh, one, one uh, volunteer of us, he started to document how, um, how to install um, a free Android on his mobile phone. So both of us before we had Open Moco. Does who, who of you knows the Open Moco still? Okay. So we had those uh, Open Mocos. They are um, open hardware and a lot of free software on those mobile phones. Uh, very nice uh, computer. Problem was for making phone calls. Uh, <laughs> wasn't that good at that time and both of our girlfriends at that time they were not very happy with the voice quality of our phone calls <laughs> and um, he improved that by uh, buying another phone and trying to stick to free software values by installing that and he documented that and um, at one point uh, we received an email by Richard Stallman who wrote like that's a very nice campaign uh, but you should change, and then he, he had some suggestions what we should change for this campaign. And Thorsten, who, who was the volunteer there, he told me, like, th those suggestions all make sense, but why is he talking about a campaign? Um, and uh, then he thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> and uh, that was the start where, uh, like, we then helped uh, Thorsten to improve the pages, our translators translated it, um, we um, we made uh, leaflets, printed them, distributed them, and that's how this uh, started. We afterwards had workshops where we help people to flash free software operating systems on their mobile phones. We explained them how to uh, get um, their programs in free app stores like F-Droid. Uh, nowadays we are mainly promoting F-Droid, the, the uh, free software repository and program for, for mobile phones. Um, but that's how, how they started, was one person who had an idea and who, who did something and uh, then there were others who liked the idea who joined him and uh, later we had lots of workshops in different places and uh, lots of media attention uh, about this and nowadays still lots, lots of people referring to that and, uh, and helping others to, to free their, their phones. Very similar to that um, is our uh, PDF Freelance campaign. So there um, uh, we talked with some volunteers about the fact that, uh, when, uh, that the, on, on a lot of pages of the public administration uh, there was uh, um, advertisement for proprietary software. So they wrote there that in order to uh, view the PDF files on their website you need a certain program and uh, that you can download this program gratis on this website. And we, first of all, we said that's not correct because there are a lot of free software programs with uh, which you can also open that. And furthermore, it's advertisement for, uh, for proprietary companies. So we thought, what can we do about that? And we came up also with the comparison that like when you're on this highway, 
and uh, then there would be a sign uh, if you want to drive on this road you need a Toyota you can make it greatest test drive at your Toyota dealer and uh, your government and um, that's something which most people agree that this is not a uh, right thing to do for government so the volunteers at that time they started to first make a website pdfreaders.org to list all the free software alternatives uh, which you can use to open <coughs> PDFs then uh, we made a petition for people to sign that uh, they don't agree with the public administration doing advertisement and then we asked people to submit us uh, all the websites they know about with the postal address of the public administrations. And after we had this uh, long backlist, we uh, printed all those letters and then by snail mail, because we thought that this is the best thing for uh, public administrations, we sent a lot of snail mail out to, um, to all those public administrations. Those were over uh, 2,100 uh, institutions. And we, um, that was the first time our ma uh, letterbox in the, in the office was also full on some days before that. I mean, most of the time we just received emails. But um, at that time we received feedback from the uh, Prime Minister of Belgium, from the Prime Minister's office of France, from lots of mayors all over Europe, uh, from, uh, yeah, it was very positive feedback where people said, yeah, we, that, that sounds interesting, sounds fine, we agree with your argumentation, like the, the criminal uh, police said, we agree with that your argumentation makes sense, uh, so, okay, they, they know what, <laughs> how, what makes sense or not, so um, we just had two complaints about all of that, that was uh, um, one uh, hospital in Germany, they said they will sue us because of that, don't know what, why, why that, but that was one reaction, and the other one was uh, Adobe at that point. Uh, they also complained about that campaign. But beside that, we in the end we managed to get uh, a 53 percent success rate. So of those 2,100 uh, organizations, uh, over 1,100 afterwards changed it, and now either refer to uh, also free software alternatives or uh, completely remove the advertising. And just because I like this example so much, uh, it's, it's in German, but um, it, it was a website from the city of Hamburg. And what they wrote is, uh, there are many programs to read PDFs. Uh, the following list of PDF readers is vendor neutral. All the programs are free software, which grant you the four freedoms to use, study, share and improve. Um, this gives you control over your computer and helps you to protect your privacy. Uh, so that, that's just such a nice example, especially uh, this was available on the URL hamburg.de slash adobe. Uh, it's not available there anymore since a few months, but that was one of the nicest things we <laughs> received there. Um, okay, so another thing at the moment we, we, we do every year is, um, we think that in the free software community we often are uh, too critical towards each other. We uh, well, not too critical, but most of the year we are critical, and we write bug reports, feature requests. We complain that this can be be done in a better way, or that's wrong, and often we forget to say thank you. And uh, this is just a very quick call to you. Uh, one day a year, we ask you to send a thank you to free software developers out there. We decided that the 14th of February might be a good day, so not just the flower industry benefits from that day, but also the free software community. So remember this day, and next year on the 14th of February, write some thank you letter uh, to a free software developer you know, or someone here in this group, uh, buy them a drink, uh, cook them something nice. Uh, there are several developers I already see here. So, choose one. <laughs> um, one of the other things we, we do is uh, we send out a lot of uh, materials to support people around Europe to promote free software. So we do leaflets, we translate leaflets, or lots of our volunteers, they, they do translations in lots of languages, like our newsletter is uh, in average uh, translated in eight languages. and. Um, 
So um, we, we have lots of different uh, translations of leaflets and we send them around. So if you ever need something to promote free software, like we have some about encryption, about free software on mobile phones, about digital rights uh, or restriction management, and um, you can just order that on this URL. I made a huge mistake that I didn't print more. So they are just a little bit outside, but here you can order as much as you want. And uh, this one is just for example um, a few weeks ago. Uh, at one evening, there were all the mails coming in, one after the other. And I already thought that there is a spam bot uh, on our website. And but then I checked them, and no, uh, they were all quite valid addresses. And the comments also looked all right. And then I found out that uh, there was a, a website uh, on, on Reddit. There was uh, a post from someone who had a picture of uh, a sticker which was similar to the one we have who said like this is the best uh, sticker I had for a long time and then in the comments somewhere down someone wrote oh I uh, ordered a similar one from FSFE so in 48 hours we had uh, more orders than usually in a half a year <laughs> and uh, that's just we, we had to bring uh, more than four it was four batches and that's just one of them on, on the second day. Uh, so <laughs> that was uh, a lot of things going out. And afterwards now we have double of the orders on average than we had before that. And uh, that was mainly because of the, the sticker on the right side there. Uh, that's one of the ones which was, uh, yeah, was the one who caused all that. So if you need anything of this, order it, distribute it to your libraries cafes, friends, whatsoever. And uh, yeah, all of those activities, they have just been possible because we have so many volunteers who started that and who support the activities. Like one person had, had the idea, started documenting something, someone else improved the text, others translated it, others helped to bring that to journalists or helped uh, give talks about that. And uh, then we had the sustaining members who support us uh, and our donors who support us with money so we can pay people to, to make uh, new designs and to, to also give, uh, give speeches on a, on a paid basis and travel around and talk with people about free software. So all of those things, they wouldn't be possible with all of them plus all the other organizations who work with us on those topics. To give you a, a brief outlook on what we are planning in the, in the next time, um, there is one topic which we see more and more, that's that um, these machines, which are so powerful, they are more and more restricted. So uh, when, you had, um, when you had products before which you were allowed to, um, to repair and to tinker around, to play with it, with, to experiment with it, Nowadays, um, they include software and computers in that and then they tell you that you are not allowed to modify it anymore and that you also, you own this device, you are not allowed to make modifications, you are not allowed to alter those devices to do as what, what you want or pay others to do those modific modifications. And that's something where we want to counter that and make sure that as the owner of a product of a computer, you are always allowed to modify it, to change things with the hard and software, and afterwards also to sell those devices. Because that's something you, you can do with your property usually, and that's also something which should be possible when it includes software. And uh, one concrete thing we are doing there at the moment is that there is the EU directive on the radio. Um, a radio directive and on our website you can read more about that the the um, the thing is that uh, computers which have network connectivity over wireless or other um, uh, things which which use radio they will be restricted with this directive what you can do with those devices and that uh, it's, it's at the moment leading to the situation that uh, um, that vendors will lock down devices and that you are not allowed to use like other, um, other software on your router or on your laptop or on your mobile phone. 
So that's something uh, we just yesterday published a, a statement which was signed by lots of organization. Uh, you can still sign this statement, you can inform uh, politicians about this and spread the knowledge about that. It's something which uh, just popped up uh, because uh, th there was a similar discussion in the US and then we checked what, how is the situation in Europe and found out, oh, there is already the directive and it's already decided and now member states should implement that and now we are working to make sure that member states implement it in a way that you can still modify uh, your hardware and install free software on those machines and that you can also benefit from others doing that and buying their products. The, um, the other big goal of us is that uh, we want to to make sure that software which is financed with public money has to be published as free software. So we think that when public money is used, the public should also benefit from that and everybody should, uh, should have uh, equal rights to use the outcome uh, from that uh, public money and benefit from that, be it as an individual, as an organization, as a company, as another uh, public administration. And uh, that's something where we will have a, a workshop soon to talk about ideas how to do that and then we hope that many people will will uh, join us in this and many organizations will join us that we in the next years we always push for this and you know, make sure that everything from the public administration here like the city of Barcelona to the European Commission to research institutions that they all do that and there are already some examples where organizations do that in this way uh, but it's uh, it's not uh, yet a uh, very common practice. And that's something we want to change. So, there's a lot to do. Um, there was a lot, a lot of things were done already. Uh, there are a lot of things ahead of us. And um, it's often, uh, it's often, it can be frustrating because it takes a long time to make all those changes. You saw that 10 years, uh, uh, with the with micro with the Microsoft case, several years to get the the success with PDF readers and uh, with all the other toxins. Often it takes a long, long time to change society. I think if all a lot of people work together and a lot of people, everybody does something small in this puzzle, it will be, it will be possible. And it's important because there are still many people around this world who do not benefit from fundamental freedoms like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, they, they don't benefit from that yet. They have to fight for them every day. And um, as a society, when you, when you once got those rights and you have those freedoms, it doesn't stop there. You have always have to continue to defend them and make sure that, uh, that, you, uh, that you lift them in your society. And when things change, like huge things in, in the in society, you also sometimes have to add new rights to that. And nowadays, when there are more and more computers around us and they control a lot of the things we do, we also have to add another freedom, which is software freedom, that everybody is in control or can be in control of the infrastructure that this is this, uh, distributed and that software freedom helps to support all those other freedoms again. So that's something why we still have to work for and continuously defend the right to modify our own hard and software and uh, that we can use, study, share and improve our software. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward for your comments, discussions and uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, I have a question about the public administration ah, okay. in Mardores. Uh, in your opinion, which is the best argument to convince someone in the administration that they should work with uh, free and open source software? Because some, I try to convince them, but it's so difficult. And I need uh, some ideas. And, and, and the other uh, question is, uh, 
which are the arguments to say no to, to FOSS? Why, why they, they decide not to use open software? Okay, so um, most of the time when, when I talk with people for the first time, it's, uh, and when it's not about very specific uh, case, it's, uh, I, I ask them some questions. Like I ask them, um, would you prefer that you can use uh, the software you procure for any purpose? Would you like to make sure that nobody else can decide uh, and can prevent you from using it for, for certain areas, that a company can restrict you as public administration on what you can do or what you cannot do with the, with the software? Um, I, I sometimes make comparisons like uh, when, you, when you buy a car, for uh, for the civil uh, for for the public administration, would you agree to the terms that you are not allowed to change the color? Uh, you are just allowed to use it for one person, just in this area of the world. Uh, you are not allowed to modify it, like for example, for uh, that you add uh, some things there that handicapped people can uh, can also drive the car. Uh, you can might make uh, want to make modifications, like to add some signals or write police on the car, would those be things you would, would agree to? Um, I also asked them, like, uh, wouldn't it be good if, uh, if you don't have to trust the vendor, but uh, that you can ask others uh, to also check what the software is really doing, that's especially like when it's more um, on, on a security level, that's something which like for the public administration in the city not that relevant, also it should also be relevant because also uh, cities use more and more private uh, sensitive data um, and uh, so I asked them about that then I asked them if it wouldn't be good if uh, like when they when they want to have some modifications <coughs> to the software that they don't depend on one vendor but they can also ask other companies like local companies to make modifications to that um, and, um, and I asked them if it wouldn't be nice if uh, they could also share the software with other public administrations so they can exchange data. And um, I never got feedback like, uh, I don't care about that, but most people agree yeah, that that would be nice, that would be good. And then I tell them that that's what they will get when they uh, procure software under free software licenses. So that's mostly the, the first argumentation there. Then of course, it, it can go in all, all kind of different direction, like with uh, support of local economy, uh, um, keeping knowledge in your area, not just being the users of, uh, of technology, but also making sure that you grow uh, this capacity in, in your area, um, because that also supports companies. Like when you, when as public administration, you, you get a software, um, then uh, you also have this knowledge there from people who can then write better software for, um, for companies in your area. So other companies will also benefit from this knowledge in, in the, at, at this space. Um, arguments against uh, free software. Um, it's uh, most of the time I would say that the arguments are a result from some misunderstandings. So there are arguments like uh, we don't get support for free software because we have to talk to communities. Um, so that's something where they didn't see that there are lots of companies who give support for free software. You can buy support for free software. You can uh, give people, uh, companies money to, to, uh, to write this. Uh, I mean, you just have to look at the news. Uh, Red Hat now had two billions. Uh, reach 2 billion uh, euro and they provide support uh, and uh, there are lots of companies out there who do that but often they just heard yeah free software that's this community thing so that, that's one argument um, then um, another one is often that um, people are in general afraid of migrations that are about changes so it wouldn't matter that's, that's not free software specific it, it wouldn't matter if they change from Microsoft uh, Windows to Apple, uh, Mac OS X, or from Mac OS X to Microsoft, or from Microsoft to Google Linux, or from Google Linux to BS, uh, BSD, or whatever. So uh, there are a lot of arguments about, in, in general, uh, against migrations. And um, 
yeah, also that migration costs money and that it's difficult with yearly budgets to invest that money, also you will benefit in the future. Um, and uh, let me think what are other, some of the mostly, there, there are some about license misunderstandings, the ones I, I mentioned before, that we, we, we have to publish everything then and it will also, we, we might have to publish sensitive data of our citizen, yeah, so that, those are some of the, Ones, yeah. Thank you. There is a lot of uh, value in your answer. Thank you. I don't hear you. sign this statement, um, so have a look at it and also uh, have a look at if you agree with the demands we, we uh, published there and if you want to spread this, so that's, that's very helpful. We, we are already in contact with uh, one MEP who also cares a lot about this, but uh, two are already double <laughs> and uh, if we get more then uh, that's uh, much appreciated. Yeah, of course, that would be perfectly possible. And the, the question was about the do some some summary of what the current situation of, of uh, software patents is in, in Europe. Because it changed a lot. It was put under the rag and it resurrects like a zombie or whatever from time to time. And now, you know, what's the what's the current situation right now? Mm. But, so um, the current situation is that uh, you are not allowed to patent software. But there is a backdoor which says uh, it says that software as such is not patentable, and um, then uh, a lot of companies manage to get software patents in by arguing that they are not software patents, but there there is some connection with the physical world, and uh, then they, they argue like that, and a lot of the um, a lot of those patents were granted and are still granted, and. Um, we are also in discussions like with the European Patent Office, explaining them what harm they can do when they grant such patents. Um, there were, um, there are like uh, discussions like on the, as I mentioned in the in the German Parliament, where um, the argumentation was about um, you get you get rights from uh, from copyright but they are taken away from you through patent law. And uh, there the argumentation was that we should make sure that you still get those rights and that patent law is too powerful at the moment in the European, uh, with the European patent system uh, compared to, uh, to the copyright you have. And that for programming it's much better to use copyright uh, than to use patents. And, uh, as a lot of ideas are combined and, and the software development works different than in some other areas where patents might make sense. So the situation is 
it's not good. There are patents which are granted. Um, we try to convince people to uh, the European Patent Office to grant less of those. Uh, there are uh, movements to uh, to bring patents together in patent pools. Uh, so it's not so harmful. But in the end, it, um, we are hoping for some new opportunities to bring this topic on the political agenda again, that we can. Uh, again explain those and meanwhile lots of companies also understood that much more which at the time we had the last debate uh, they were still on the on the other side but now they understood that patents are really uh, software patents are also bad for them so we hope that soon there will be opportunity and then we can improve that a little bit further Matthias, thanks. Uh, very great presentation. One quick question that I hope we can follow up later on. But uh, what cities in Europe would be interesting reference uh, examples for us that we could learn from here for the city of Barcelona? Okay, so um, there is one which is always mentioned. It's the city of Munich, where you can learn a lot from. But uh, like in general, it, it depends a little bit on which subject and what you want to do. I mean, the city of Munich did this huge step. They want to migrate their desktop uh, operating system to, or also, also did that. That's a huge change and it's a lot of work and they uh, struggled with that for several years now and, and uh, they accomplished that, but it took a long time. Um, I, most of the time I suggest have a look at Join up. It's a, a website from the uh, European Commission, and they publish case studies. They publish case studies about um, public uh, hospitals who develop free software together. They publish case studies from regions in Spain who use that also to to get more uh, economy uh, to get their economy growing. They publish case studies from uh, from from Sweden how public administration use public procurement to improve the situation there. Uh, from UK policies and so on. So that's a very good resource to have a look at. And at the moment, we are also gathering uh, policies about like this that free so publicly financed software has to be published as free software. We, we gather that on our wiki so you can have a good overview of how is the situation in other countries about that. But especially for cities, it's I think join up is a very good resource for that. Then you can get some inspiration, also see okay, that's something we can do here. So let's leave here the question rounds. We have to start getting out. Good news is that we are staying for a bit. So if you have more questions, we can move outside and continue talking on a much more casual scenario. Uh, nobody bites anyone, so that's good. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for coming. It was a very nice presentation. And well, see you outside. Yes. Thank you.